Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the Art League, uh, Sunday with the Artist program. Uh, this is a program, we've done a few of these in the past, but now we are really, with the upcoming new year, going to be doing it on a regular basis and filming it, you know, and making a special place on our YouTube channel and uh, on our website for Sunday with the Artists. And uh, anyway, we, uh, we are so pleased and so proud to have been able to sponsor this exhibit. Jean Bannis's paintings of Caddy Smith sculptures and Nancy McElroy's sculptures, and Mark, wherever you are, there you are, poetry. <laughs> there are also a few other people here. There is David Axelrod, who's a former poet laureate for Volusia County. Volusia County. Right. I am now poet laureate for Volusia County, oh, formerly oh, okay. Suffolk County, Long Island, New York, but very glad to be here. Well, I tell you what, we're glad to have you. This is, this is quite an honor for you to be here. It's, to me, this was one of the most exciting exhibits that we've done in a long time. For one thing, to look at two-dimensional art and ask yourself, how do you turn this into the written word? How do you turn it into uh, three-dimensional art? And I hope you all feel free to ask the artists today that very question, you know, how, how does it happen, you know? Uh, what inspires you? So, without anything else, I'm turning it over to Jean. This is the real Jean Baines. <laughs> this is how all of my art friends recognize me, and I do thank you all for coming. Uh, I wanted to show you how I paint. When I paint, the floor is covered with paint. I'm covered with paint. The canvas is painted. It's also covered with, there's paint all over the place. I have paint on my face and my hair. So when I do paint, I, I vigorously, I have large brushes, and I go like this and like that, and then I dip again, and then I make some marks. So, so I cover the whole thing, like no thinking, no planning, no thinking about what I'm going to do. And then as I work, I uh, respond to the painting itself, and after a while, the painting speaks to me, and I respond to it, and sometimes I fight what I think I should do, and I keep doing what I want, and it doesn't respond well. So the painting says, listen to me, and then I start painting what I should do, or sometimes I totally wreck a painting. It's just hopeless, and Picasso said that, paint until you destroy a painting, and then you're ready to start. So that's generally <laughs> what happens. I have 10, 20 coats of painting on, paints on my canvas, and my old friends always tell me who are in the workshops with me that every 15 minutes there's a new painting on the, on the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just uh, take this off now. Uh, so I've been painting since about 1974 when I lived in Washington, D.C. And after I moved here, thank you for coming. Uh, I joined the Artist Workshop, I joined the Art League, I joined the St. Augustine Art League. And uh, I've exhibited throughout the country for different exhibits. So that's all I have to say. I would like to introduce now the sculptors. Caddy, would you come up? This was such an honor for me when I was asked to interpret some of Jean's paintings with sculpture. And that's exactly what happened. Jean sent us the images and we got to look at them and decide what to sculpt. So someone early on said to me, it's amazing how they go with the paintings. And I said, well, that wasn't by accident. It, you know, really happened. And um, so this particular one is definitely a story in my mind when I look at it. And I, right away, I saw a Native American sitting there in thought, and somebody else may see something else. I have done Native American pieces before, and I have a real affection for that. I guess if anyone who's seen Dancers with Wolves feels the same way. But um, usually I sculpt without looking at anything. I just start sculpting, and that was the case with this piece, which was coiled from the bottom up. So I start at the bottom, you know, and just work up, and things happen as I go along. However, because I'd never done a skull, of um, 
a steer before, I had to look up images so that I would know the proper uh, relationship of this part of the skull to this part and whatever, so that's what I did. And one of the things, I'll jump ahead of myself, one of the things that's most interesting is when you put the color on, I made my own colors with mason stains and underglazed base, which is just a clear base, and you mix the powdered stains in it, and you make your own colors, and you can mix the colors just like you do painters do. And, but what you put on this piece of clay is not necessarily what comes out of the kiln. It can get darker, lighter, whatever else. You just don't know. And sometimes they're great surprises. And the teeth on this were my best surprise. I love the teeth. And, you know, it just happens with what you do. I see the teeth? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was really neat. But... <laughs> Once I inscribe a scene on the um, piece and put the color on it, um, I fire it for the first time. And then I go back and I put a copper oxide wash, which is totally black, all over the piece. And so the piece looks black. Then I take a wet sponge and I wipe it off. And the black stays in all the incised parts. So that's really one of the reasons the teeth turned out so well, because it had, you know, little divisions in there that the black got in. And so that's what made it turn out that way. Then you fire it again. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a painter, art uh, sculptor yesterday at a workshop. And we were talking about sculpting. And she said, sculpting is so intimate versus painting, you know, which she does both. And I gave that a lot of thought, and it is so true. And I was telling her, I'm now doing painting, that I don't ever forget the name or whatever of a sculpture I do, or the face or whatever, but sometimes I have to go back and try to remember what the name of the painting is. But it's because it's so individual, it's, um, it, it's so real to me the sculptures as as you're going along, especially if it's figurative, and all of a sudden somebody's looking back at you, that's really powerful. So if you've never tried it and you have the time, just go for it. It's it's really lots of fun. So this this was a real joy to do and the colors I was very pleased how they came out very much like Jean's painting. Nancy McElroy, a wonderful sculptor who does not do figurative work, but she does wonderful abstract work. And I'm going to let her talk about that. When we were invited to interpret the paintings, the show was coming right up. And if you work with clay, it's not a, a quick process. So I um, work with slabs mostly. And when I started my sculptural part of things, I started with boxes. So I created a box for each one of these paintings. And uh, I was also a functional ceramic potter in the beginning. So in my opinion and my you know, process, everything kind of had to have a function, even in, in, in clay. You know? So being a box, it had to have a lid. And that's what you have as a function in there. So OK, I started with a square a box, and then I kept going back to this painting and, and looking deeper and into the, the color and the excitement and the journey that you are taken on with this fabulous painting. Uh, you, you just, you take it from a little bit of chaos, you go through the cave, and you come out to this, to this bright, uh, magnificent energy, so, um, okay, I got clay, mounds of that in front of me, and I'm like, well, let's, let's put that to, to the energy she has given me. So I, um, I, I saw a lot of things. As you can see, this here uh, is, your, is your combination and energy brush strokes. So you doodle on that with all the different colors. 
Now, I will explain that I think I, I, I got to be a part of this, I think, largely because I do low fireware, earthenware. And with that, you do get bright color. And look around, jean is bright color. So I, I thought, OK, I, I get it. That's, that's what I'm going to do when I have to bring my color. Never would I, I haven't used this color in a, ever. And I'm like, hmm, there it is. So OK, that's, that's what this will have to be. And then this cobalt down in here, there was like a C. So you're just sort of pushing your clay. I rip and tear and, and roll and, and scrunch a lot of clay to get your texture. And that brings it into the three dimensional. So the back of this indicates the energy here. Uh, so you just start messing and, and placing it on. And what happened in drying so quickly, uh, this clay, you can't dry it quickly. I learned you have to cover it, let it go slowly, because cracks will develop even when you bisque fire. So after it's bisque fired, you then apply your coats of color refire re it, uh, 1900 degrees or so, and then um, you open your kiln and, and wow, you, you've got a lot of orange. <laughs> I was like, wow! <laughs> and I, and I saw, I, and I, you know why that's there. That's there because of that line. <laughs> you see the orange lines? <laughs> Well, I saw it, and I saw this big, like, orange carrot came out. And I was like, oh, do I tone it down? Do I refire it? Do I take the element of the texture that's in this and bring it out? And I kept playing back and forth with it. I said, no, no, don't touch it. Just, it was a bold statement. I mean, if you go bold like I have to go bold, you taught me that in this process, so I left it alone. Um, the other element I take into uh, my work is a little bit of Mother Nature. I, I love gems and minerals. I, my eight-year-old son loved them, and I, I was a bigger fan than he was of collecting the rocks. You know, he, he moved on. I didn't. I still love rocks and minerals. And um, so this is an azurite. I put it in the dome, so the sparkle has to get looked for. But it's a tremendous mineral with a lot of, of sparkle. Mother Nature does wonderful things. So, so basically, it was a, a quick build and fun because you had to do like more after this. Uh, six of them each for us, I believe. So um, you know the process was was moved faster than I normally do, and um, but I liked the turnaround in that. It taught me quicker, and I really really appreciate the ability to now get inspiration from 2D work. Um, I hadn't thought of doing that. I was always looking at landscapes and nature and all of those, but to look at at the, at the vision of an artist in her 2D work and the boldness of color, um, I thought, okay, I, I can do that. I can do that with these colors and that's what I should do. So um, I just had fun and I, I, again, thank you for that. And, and we all interpret things differently with who we are and uh, that's about it. That's what I have to say. Hello, Mark, yes. <laughs> In the idea of interpreting things differently, I'm looking at that, and I see something in that which is not in the painting to me, which is the white portion. The, the white clay portion is human. It's, I see faces and body and hair and hands. This? Yeah. And I see on the same on the other side. <laughs> and I think that adds a whole other dimension to the to the total total picture. So you know you pulled something out of the picture that wasn't in the picture. Hmm. And you put it there and gave it another not to mention a giant carrot. And I was gonna say, and I pulled a carrot out. <laughs> yeah, you were hungry when you <laughs> It's a, but again, when you open the kiln, I mean, I hadn't used this neon orange uh, many times. Uh, so you don't know 
you you painted on three coats and it's and it's creamy color or it's white or it's a little bit of a tint of this or green it's never this color nothing is so it is a very big surprise hopefully more delightful than shock um but it it i have had some and then there's all of the glaze uh tr trouble with um crazing pinholes crawling all the glazes themselves can give you a lot of trouble sometimes if you if you fire it too fast if you then if you open the kiln too soon and there, there's a lot to to the process of losing whatever it is you've done there's a lot of chance in ceramic art so i'm always delighted when i see that okay it worked and again being a sculpture i can pretend it was what i wanted and that, <laughs> As we all can, but your painting, you know, it's speaking to you. This speaks to me as I work with it. Clay is is extremely therapeutic. You just you can't stop. Sometimes it's just malleable and fun, and and um, but it it can crack too. So anyway, any other questions? No. No. Good. Oh, hi. I know those are both fire glazes. What kind are they? I have a, a blend of spectrum and amico, you know, jar glazes. I don't do my mixing. Um, there's a lot uh, to experiment when you do a glaze formula for the first time. And, and what kind of clay are you using? A, a white low It's clay? a white low fire, yes. I'm not sure. I might have been using highway clay by this point. I'm not remembering. I've switched a few clay bodies in time, but. Uh, um, the white, I feel, always, you know, represents your color better as opposed to the red clay bodies, the terracottas. So, good question. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi, Mark Davidson, poet and other things. I'm much inspired by Dr. Axelrod, who's my mentor and has led me into many interesting things. Uh, to do with poetry and other things. Uh, this painting here, I was not given the title of the painting or any of the paintings that she sent us to play with. Um, so I just, I looked at it and I saw what I saw and it will be instructive on the question of interpretation that I'm going to read this other poem, which was an entirely different poet who saw something entirely different than I did in this painting. But since I'm here, I'm going to read mine first. Okay. The title of mine is The Sentinel. Alone it stands, the last bulwark against the invasion that never comes, a great red sphinx looming over the cliffs, guarding the waves and clouds, outwardly alert. But inside, the fortress echoes with barrenness. The last of its platoons melted away, returned to their lives as businessmen, farmers, servers. Its meaning gone, its use now useless. It slowly, meaningfully crumbles away. Only the gulls, wheeling and crying among the cliffs, man the battlements, prepared to do battle with the weather and advance in conquest upon the fish. And that's, that is what I saw. Now, the other poet, whose name is Linda Eve Diamond, and who's a wonderful poet, by the way, but could not be here with us today. This is what she saw. Vespa. The Vespa idles on the wall as I sit idly by, wishing I could take it for a spin or even be so bold as that fiery red ride in its lavender world. Or the bluebird in flight, drawn out and set free by the Vespa's cool silhouette. It's just a little daydream I like to hide in the abstract so I don't have to act or explain why I haven't ever even tried riding some cute little scooter. If someone asks, what's that? I can say, it's something else or nothing, just an abstract, and I don't even know what I see in it. But inside, I'm riding a red Vespa, letting loose like Audrey Hepburn, hitting the concrete on my abstract Vespa on my own secret Roman holiday getaway. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was asked earlier about you know, the process of extracting um, a poem from a flat painting or from a piece of sculpture or vice versa. 
And here I will refer again to Dr. Axelrod, who advice to me was, don't tell me what the damn painting looks like. I can see it for myself. <laughs> Write what, how it makes you feel. And so that's basically how you do it. You, you know, I looked at that and I said, there's a story in there. And, you know, you sort of extract the story. And Linda extracted quite a different story, but I'm sure the process is more or less the same. And I'm pretty sure it could work the other way, too. If, you know, if I wrote a poem about something and uh, Jean heard the poem and said, that makes me think of a picture, she would paint it. And so my, I will end by encouraging all of you to go out and write poems and paint pictures and make sculptures. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, some other local poems, poets who couldn't make it today. Uh, this particular one here, uh, it's a lovely name, you named B.J. Alligood, who's a prize-winning poet and a member of our, our Tomoka Poets group. And this one here, uh, the poet is Marianne Westbrook, who is the president of our Tomoka Poets group. And I encourage you to read those and look at the paintings and think about it. Uh, there are other poets here who I'm not familiar with. Uh, but who did the same thing, you know, looked at the painting and in the other gallery as well. Uh, there's two, uh, two more here by me. This one here is by me, and on the far end you'll see a card with no painting next to it, and that's by me too, but Jean says she painted over that one. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess my inspiration wasn't enough to save it. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say a few things which I forgot to talk about. Um, I, I was always very inspired by books that I have read and by movies I have seen. And one movie that really struck me and hit me right in the heart was uh, the movie Precious, where a teenage girl was uh, sexually abused. And uh, when I short was after that, I attended a workshop and I felt the rage where I finally came to terms with things that happened in my life. And that painting uh, was about a little girl who was sexually abused. I read a book about that and the partnered with that. So I did a whole series on sexual abuse. I did also a series of uh, works on um, slavery and the civil rights movement and about war. So I'm very interested in social issues. Um, are there any other questions? I just wanted to mention that too. Jean, where do you sign your paintings? Oh, I didn't hear the question. Could you? Where do you sign your paintings? On the back. Okay. Uh, I find that most artists <laughs> feel that the paintings uh, should have the, uh, have the name on the back. Because every mark, every little, every little line, every little mark that you put on a painting adds to the painting. And I find that the name on the bottom right always distracts me from the painting. And sometimes people put great big names on there. And it really does affect the painting. So I, I put my name on the back. Any other questions? But somebody will have to interpret because I don't hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what you were talking about signing on the back, um, Trish Thompson said she signed hers on the back in case somebody painted over her signature and oh. then took her painting as, as their own. So she had her signature on the back. Uh huh. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have any visions for? changes in how you think in the future or do you have anything in mind that you want to tackle that you haven't done? She wants to know if you thought about images for the for future paintings or oh. doing something you haven't done yet. Um, no, um, I, I just start as I say, I just throw the paint on and then like it's an, um, subconscious what shows up on my work. And I always am surprised, too, at when I see the ending of a painting and I decide that it's finished and I think, oh, 
And then I think about the title because I see something that came out of me from the de depth of my soul or what I was feeling that day. Uh, one day I was really angry and frustrated and I thought, I think I'm going to paint that. Well, I painted the blackest painting, and, and it turned out to be really good. It won an award, so <laughs> one never knows. Okay. What propelled you to become an artist? Did you start when you were a little uh, girl, or kind of further into it? No, um, I took one class of drawing in high school, but I was always interested in, in uh, doing some artwork. So when the children were off at school and I was able to have time for myself, I did that. And I read a lot of books and go to a lot of movies and I'm inspired by things that I see or experience. So that's what shows up eventually in my paintings. Okay.